Well, good evening. Good evening. Well, uh, welcome to UAF's seventh summer presenting this Healthy Living Lecture Series. Over the past years, the series has featured roughly 75 local experts on health topics important to lessons. I'm Mike Powers. I'll be introducing tonight's speaker. As a reminder, these Healthy Living Lectures are the result of Michelle Bartlett's vision regarding community and university connectivity. UAF and the Fairbanks community have forged an exceptionally close relationship in looking at the personalities in this room. I know many of you know this, but uh, the programs and the partnerships and the personalities from both the university and the Fairbanks community have worked closely on many, many projects over the past hundred years. For example, I think of the state's constitution that was drafted at Signers Hall just across the mall from this building in the winter of 55. From a health perspective, the university and community partnership is historically demonstrated in the events following the 67 flood that forced this community to rebuild its hospital. And UA President William Wood headed up the building of their next Memorial Hospital debt free. The effort was quietly and effectively supported by leading citizens like Harry Porter, engineering professor Bill Mendenhall, contractor Con Frank, labor organizer Cornfine. And since then, by people like the former and current university regents, such as Karen Perdue and the former Mike Kelly, who had both the university and the health connections in the community. In the spirit of coming together in community engagement, Michelle Bartlett's kept up the university community tradition uh, robustly by advancing many outreach efforts that's added to the quality of life in Fairbanks, lectures, courses, and other programs, school programs, etc. With that, let me introduce tonight's speaker by way of a little Fairbanks cardiology history. Cardiology has always been discussed as a needed service in Fairbanks, dating back to Fairbanks Memorial Hospital rising from the receding 67 floodwaters. In about 2000, after things settled from the oil bust in the mid late 1980s, planning really began uh, getting serious, largely driven by a call from the community. To gain approval for the project, a health planner from the lower 48 that worked closely with Fairbanks Memorial, Rob Stetson, spent a lot of time in Interior Rivers, noted that Dr. Thomas Arisano of Johns Hopkins University was conducting an empirical study on standalone cardiac cath labs functioning without on-site surgical backup, and demonstrated the safety and efficacy of such models of care, performing much needed angioplasties without on-site surgical backup, saving many lives in far-flung communities such as Fairbanks. Dr. Arison was invited to Fairbanks and began making the rounds, meeting with local physicians, Anchorage physicians, local board members, community members, and state uh, Department of Health and Social Service officials. And after considerable planning with some highly skeptical local physicians and some highly adversarial Anchorage physicians, <laughs> uh, FMH was able to advance these services without the uh, cardiac catheterizations without surgical backup. The hospital, with Arisano's study, laid the groundwork, and it was highly credible local physicians such as Mike Carroll and Dr. Rich Berger, who really pushed the the ball over the, over the end zone and became an approval. The hospital then recruited Dr. Rick Latham and operated Alaska's first standalone cardiac cath lab. Among the several key milestones in this cardiology effort at FMH since 2007 was Dr. Ramel Wren joining this effort. And it's been, he's been the bedrock of the cardiac program here in Fairbanks uh, ever since. Dr. Wren has received his medical degree from Tulane University School of Medicine. He's been in practice roughly 25 years. He is widely recognized as a highly skilled cardiac physician who's actively engaged in the Fairbanks community. He's approachable, he's beloved by his patients, and he's committed to advancing the cardiology program of Fairbanks. Talking to Dr. Wren last night, I was remembering the challenge of recruiting two interventional cardiologists back in 2007, and now Dr. Wren is leading the effort in building a team of four interventional cardiologists, which is a testimony to his leadership and the growth of the FHP cardiology program. So with that, please welcome Dr. Ramel Wren, who will be speaking on heart health, common arrhythmias, seeking medical care and fairness. Thanks, Mike. 
Uh, that was really very interesting information there. Um, Rick Latham, actually the first cardiologist here, uh, trained with me uh, at uh, Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, Rick was a year ahead of me and he was actually my mentor for my research project uh, that I did to, to finish my fellowship. Rick gave me a call in 2009 and wanted to know if I would slow down and come here and I said, well, why not just come help out for a while? So I came for a week at a time from 2009 through 11 and, uh, and then Rick called one day and said, hey, can you come to stay? And my daughter was finishing high school in 2012, and I decided to come in April 2012. And I told my patients in Louisiana that I would be away for three years. And um, <laughs> so <laughs> it's been uh, about nine years now, and, and uh, I really love it here. And, and um, this is a wonderful program. I've uh, spoken here on several times before, and uh, it's, it's really nice to get out to, uh, to meet everyone. The talk tonight would be on common cardiac dysrhythmias and seeking medical care. And I will apologize in advance that some of the slides were maybe uh, more uh, for healthcare providers. That's okay, we'll explain those, so I'll explain those. And we'll move on for those that, that don't really make a lot of sense. Uh, so in, in keeping, we'll begin the lecture now. So the goals will be to, uh, to look at um, well, first to define cardiac dysrhythmia, uh, discuss the main dysrhythmias, uh, talk about some devices that are used for detecting dysrhythmias, and then spend the bulk of the time on atrial fibrillation. Um, on any given day in our office, we have anywhere from five to 10 patients coming in with a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. And that number is increasing um, as we go along. We'll discuss the prevalence of atrial fibrillation, its importance, how we manage it, and also how can we prevent atrial fib. If we look at the medical dictionary, uh, cardiac dysrhythmia or arrhythmia is defined as an abnormal, disordered, or disturbed rhythm of the heart. So normally when the heart is contracting, there's a, a nice rhythm where the, the SA note, which is shown up top here, feeds a signal to the AV note, and then we have activation of the bundle branches, and that's all organized. If we look at the main types of arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation is the most common type, and um, the second most common type is supraventricular tachycardia, where the heart just races away when someone is at rest. And it may go anywhere from 180 up to 220 beats per minute. And the younger a person is, one can tolerate that. My wife had this problem, supraventricular tachycardia, and we just use uh, a beta blocker to take care of this, but it seemed that every time we would go out of town, she would end up in an ER to be treated with medicine, so if, eventually she went on to have an ablation, which was done uh, in Anchorage. Um, in fact, she didn't wait for me to get off. She went down with one of my daughters and, and had it done on one day and was out of the hospital the second day, and that was four years ago, and she hadn't had any more problems for treating SVT. Bradycardia is also a problem that we can see. And that's when the heart rate is very slow. If someone has symptomatic bradycardia, then a pacemaker may be indicated. But without symptoms, a pacemaker is not indicated. Heart block um, is a, another arrhythmia. And when we see that, we know the person has to have a pacemaker right away if there's what we call complete heart block. Because within hours, the heart may suddenly stop and, and, um, and cause sudden death. Ventricular fibrillation is also a dysrhythmia that we see, but that's mainly, we see it primarily with patients who have had a heart attack or someone having a heart attack. It's a rapid, disorganized rhythm where there's no blood pressure and pe patients certainly become unconscious. When we look at the type of devices that were used to detect dysrhythmia, in 1902 and 1903, the first EKG machine was shown at the top left here, uh, was produced by Wilhelm Eindhoven. This weighed about 600 pounds. You had to put your an arm in, in uh, saline solution and at least one foot in. And then now you can see at the bottom left that the EKG machine is a much lighter, weighing just a few pounds. And we push it around on a cart. And then now there are other devices such as holter monitors. And now uh, we have advanced from this now where we don't use wires anymore for our holters. If you have, if you have holter monitoring, 
it's just a little strip that we put in the center of the chest. And you may wear it anywhere from 24 hours up to 14 days. Um, and then, of course, there are quite a few people now who have an Apple Watch or um, for Father's Day, my wife bought me a Cardia, uh, which I've seen my patients with that, you know, and, and um, but she bought me a Cardia to um, record my rhythm, and now you can record up to six leads. And when we do just a standard EKG, it's 12 leads, and this one can do six. So there are many devices now that we can use to detect heart rhythms. And what's interesting about these devices is that, for instance, with Holter's that, uh, that were developed um, about 30, 40 years ago, to find out what's normal, they had medical students wear the Holter, and, and it was determined that you may have up to 300 irregular heartbeats a day. Um, but now we have thousands of people recording their rhythms, and many of these patients have no symptoms, and we're finding out more about what type of arrhythmia, a dysrhythmia you may see in completely normal people. And it can cause confusion, too, for physicians because patients may get excited about what the Apple Watch or what Cardia is telling them because these devices let you know if you have a fast or slow heartbeat. And if it's irregular, it would say irregular rhythm. It may even say atrial fibrillation. Uh, if we look at these strips here at the top, this is a rapid heart rate. This is what we call sinus tachycardia. It's normal. You may be exercising, and the heart rate is Tachycardia is a rate anywhere from 100 to 220. If the rate is above 220, then it's flutter. Flutter is from 220 up to 350. If any chamber is moving faster than 350, then it's fibrillation. This is atrial tachycardia, and this rate is about 180. Still regular. This is bradycardia, where the rate is, where the rate is slow. Now, below sinus bradycardia, we have an even slower rhythm, and this is actually a strip from one of the patients that we took care of in the hospital, where these little blips, that's the primary pacemaker of the heart, but it's not activating the, the lower chamber. It's extremely low heart rate, and this patient required a pacemaker. And here, this very irregular rhythm, where there's no, uh, it's irregular, but irregularly irregular. This is atrial fibrillation, and frequently with atrial fib, the heart rate is the ventricular rate is very fast. It may be anywhere from 120 up to 180 beats per minute. In some conditions where there's an extra nerve in the heart, then the signal can be transferred directly to the ventricle and it contracts as fast as the atrium going at 350 beats per minute and then that's life threatening. But in most cases with atrial fib, we don't have this extra nerve and the secondary pacemaker of the heart will modulate the rate and stop it from going above 220. At the bottom here is ventricular tachycardia, this next slide. And that's a wide, bizarre rhythm. And with that, the ventricle is beating between 100 and, 100 and, and 220 beats per minute. And patients don't tolerate that very long. The longest recorded bout of VTAC that someone tolerated was probably three weeks, and that's, that's very unusual. Generally, it's only for a few hours, and, and one may pass out or have to come to the ER and, and get shocked. And at the bottom here is, is the life-threatening ventricular fibrillation. So when we look at disorganized electrical signals, there may or may not be symptoms. If there are symptoms, what are they? Well, many patients have no symptoms at all, and they find out that they have a, a dysrhythmia uh, after having an EKG. Or someone may feel weak or feel extremely tired or may have a pounding sensation in the chest. Or the person may have chest pain or a feeling of a skip beat. In Louisiana, patients would come in and say, well, it feels like a frog is jumping around in the chest. And I, I was uh, kind of tickled here when I said, questioned the patient here, and he said, well, it feels like a salmon is jumping around in the chest. And, <laughs> and uh, no joke. So it just depends on where you live. So one may have chest pain, lightheadedness, shortness of breath, shortness of air, uh, fainting or near fainting, or labored breathing. When should one go to the emergency room? Well, one should seek emergency care if there's prolonged chest pain. What's prolonged chest pain? Heavy squeezing pressure, tightness, fullness, lasting for 
less than 20 minutes, it's not a major concern, but if it's more than 20 minutes, that's long enough. If it's related to the heart, that's long enough to cause a heart attack. If there's severe lightheadedness or shortness of breath, that's another reason too to go into the ER to be seen. Now we look at the types of arrhythmias that one may have when in the hospital. About one third of patient discharges are related to um, patients who had a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. Atrial flutter is very similar to atrial fib and is treated the same way and that accounts for another 4%. So between atrial flutter and, at and atrial fib, that's about almost 40% of the patients. And then there are the atrial tachycardia, PVCs. Six sinus syndrome is also a form of atrial fibrillation where the heart may go fast or may go slow and is out of rhythm. And there may be other problems with conduction disease too, but atrial fib is the most common. So if you see an 82 year old man, what's the chances of this patient having atrial fibrillation? It's high. It's, it's high, isn't it? Yeah, but actually when we look at the data um, here for men and women between the ages of 80 and 84, women about 7.2%, men 10.3%. So at every age, it, men exceed women in terms of this dysrhythmia. However, there are more women with atrial fib than men because women live longer than men. Um, um, and I don't, you know, and yeah, so women are just, well, I learned in, in, in anatomy um, in med school that women were superior. And that's, that's a long topic. I mean, it's kind of a long, it's a, it's a different discussion, but women are uh, anatomically are superior. And, um, and um, they certainly are different. They are. And um, I tell my patients, and this is a true statistic. If a man has daughters, you live longer than a man without daughters. Uh, you get 18 months of additional life per daughter. Yeah. And then I've also learned, too, that you live longer if you listen to your wife. So, <laughs> so <laughs> um, I mean, all the stupid things that I've done, generally my wife is not around, like uh, a ladder hanging through the second floor through uh, uh, this, this. Yeah, men do crazy things, and we don't live as long. Um, but at any rate, so 82-year-old uh, man, about a 10% chance of having atrial fibrillation. What about a 46-year-old female patient coming in for an annual physical? What's the lifetime risk of developing AFib for a 46-year-old woman? Yeah, I agree with the 20, yeah, yeah well, it's high. It's uh, actually for men and women, there's a one in four chance that they would develop atrial fib. It's really a problem. Uh, it really is. And we, we're seeing many more people with AFib. So on the left, here's a normal heartbeat where everything is synchronized. In AFib, the atrium is beating over 350 beats per minute. And some of these impulses are transferred down to the ventricle. So there's a very irregular rhythm. There are two major concerns about atrial fib. If the heart is beating fast for more than two days, it tires out. There are receptors called beta receptors within the heart. And you can overstimulate these receptors to the point where they don't respond. Uh, they become phosphorylated. They become internalized and just they're not on the surface of the cell to respond. And if they're internalized for long enough, then um, they become digested. We use, and we found this out about 15 years ago, that if we use beta blockers and we block some of these receptors, then they can actually rejuvenate. Um, but any tachycardia can cause the heart to become weak if it's prolonged. The other problem with atrial fib is stroke. So one can develop a tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy due to downregulation of beta receptors, and, and this is treatable just by slowing the heart down. Uh, and then stroke is the major problem. So what's the risk of stroke in, in atrial fib? Well, in people under the age of 60, about 1% are going to have a stroke from AFib. But if you're over the age of 80, it's more like 10%. And the stroke risk in um, increases is about twice those in normal, the people in normal sinus rhythm. If we look here, um, the left, in terms of the atrium, this is the appendage, the left atrial appendage, and it's like a windsock. And when the atrium is not contracting properly, blood flow is very slow here, and a clot may form 
uh, in this area. So this is a, an echocardiogram. This is the atrial appendage, and down here is a clot sitting there. And eventually, if the patient goes back, goes back and forth from a normal rhythm to atrial fib, when the heart re returns to normal rhythm, this contracts and it squeezes that clot out. And if a clot leaves the heart, 80% of the time, that clot is going to go to the brain. 20% of the time, it goes to all the parts of the body. But 80% of the time, if the clot travels, it goes to the brain and one ends up with, with a stroke. And the stroke with atrial fib tends to be a larger stroke. It's, it's more, it, it's, it's, uh, it covers a larger area. So with atrial fib, currently, it's, it's, uh, the feeling is that there are about 6 million people in the United States with atrial fib, and this is expected to double by 2030 um, in terms of the number of people with AFib. With AFib, there's about five times increased risk of stroke and two times higher likelihood that the stroke will happen a second time once one has AFib. So let's look at some more definitions now. When AFib is first detected, it's either, we call it paroxysmal or maybe persistent. Paroxysmal means that it corrects itself in less than seven days, and in most cases, less than 24 hours. So if someone develops AFib, frequently it may be because of volume depletion or dehydration. So we just tell a person to relax, drink plenty of water, make sure you're well hydrated, and then within a matter of 24 hours, the person may go back to a normal rhythm. The first time someone has AFib, within the first 48 hours, the risk of stroke is very low. Certainly within the first 24 hours, the risk of stroke is very low. Now, if AFib persists, uh, does not correct itself within seven days, then we call it persistent. If we use medication or do a cardioversion to try to get the person back to normal rhythm, but they continue to stay in AFib after a year when the patient and the physician or the provider says, okay, we're just going to let you just live with atrial fib. And many people live with AFib as long as the rate is not very fast and then as long as they're anticoagulated to prevent a stroke. We call it permanent AFib when it lasts for more than a year and we've given up trying to correct it. If you have two or more episodes, then it's called recurrent atrial fibrillation. If AFib occurs in someone with a completely normal heart and the person's under the age of 60, it's called lone, L-O-N-E, lone atrial fib. And uh, genetically, some people develop this. non valvular AFib, you hear about this on the commercials, non valvular AFib. So there's AFib that's not associated with mitral valve disease, or it's AFib in someone who does not have a prosthetic or a mechanical heart valve. Uh, first detected AFib is new onset. Different studies in literature use different definitions for this. Now, there's a scoring system to decide on whether someone's going to have a stroke. Uh, it's called the chas vask score, the one that we use now. And with this, the, the C stands for congestive heart failure, H for hypertension, A, age of 75 or more, you get two points for that, D for diabetes, stroke. Um, if you've had a previous stroke, you get two points for that, too. Vascular disease, if there's a history of coronary artery disease or peripheral vascular disease, one gets a point for that. Age between 65 and 74, one point. And then uh, sexual category, if you're female, you get a point. Women are at higher risk for, for stroke, so you get a point for, for just for being female. Um, and then we look at the scoring system to, to determine just what the risk of stroke is. And the higher the score, the higher the risk of the annual risk for stroke. So a score of nine, and you rarely see someone with a score of nine, but we frequently see people with scores of three to six. And a score of six, there's a 10% chance per year that one may suffer a stroke. And the, th the thing that we know about anticoagulants is that if you take an anticoagulant, the risk of stroke is reduced to about 1%. So in most cases, for instance, if you have a score of one, well, the anti, the risk of also, so the risk of stroke with anticoagulant is not much better than having a score of one, but there's also a risk of bleeding when you take an anticoagulant too. And uh, so we have to offset that, the risk of clotting, having a stroke versus the risk of bleeding. So how do we prevent stroke and atrial fibrillation? Well, we use anticoagulants. We have the vitamin K anticoagulants, such as warfarin, and then we have the 
direct oral anticoagulants, or what can also be called the target specific oral anticoagulants, or another term for it, all the same, is the novel oral anticoagulants. And uh, this is the uh, clotting pathway, and there, these are various factors that promote clotting. And these various drugs, such as uh, here's Xarelto Rivaroxaban, axon factor 10A, um, Apixaban, um, also axon uh, factor 10A. And there's also heparin, which is we use intravenously axon various factors. There's another medicine we use in our cath lab called Ogatraban, which acts on uh, factor 2. But these various agents act on different areas in the clotting system. If we look at the risk reduction just with warfarin, with taking Coumadin, um, you know, and of course some, some people say, well, there's rat poison, but it's not. Uh, we, we poison rats by overdosing rats with it, right? We, do, we don't say, well, this is the right amount. We just give them a lot of it. So when rats or mice jump from one place to another, they end up with internal hemorrhaging, and, and they bleed internally, and that's how they that's how rat poison works. Um, so I do tell patients, don't hit your head, you know, when we take anticoagulants, because um, the patients that I've had die um, are patients who would fall and slip and, and have a head injury and, um, and end up with intracranial bleed and die. So don't hit your head if you're taking anticoagulant. Um, so when you look at warfarin, it reduces the risk of stroke by 65%. Uh, primary stroke, uh, in terms of absolute risk, is uh, almost 3%, and secondary stroke, 8.4. And then how p many people do we have to treat to prevent one stroke? Well, on average, about 25. And that's considered to be a low number to have to treat to prevent one. So warfarin is very effective at preventing stroke in patients, but it has several limitations. Uh, it can, can interact with foods, right? Um, so you can eat greens, but you have to eat the same amount daily. Um, certain drugs will interf and interfere with warfarin, and you have to have blood tests at least once a month. Sometimes we can get out once every six weeks. And, uh, but when you're starting out, you have to do it weekly. So it becomes a problem for very busy people to take warfarin, unless you do your um, blood tests at home. Um, the newer agents are uh, Pradaxa, which was the first um, inhibitor that, that was uh, released, and then later came Rivaroxaban or Zarelto, and then Eliquis, and then there's another one called Edoxaban, which we don't have in, in the United States to my knowledge. But these agents are effective, and studies show that they are at least as effective as warfarin, and probably more effective. If we look at the uh, trials, phase three trials, looking at the neuro or, or anticoagulants, then what we find is that uh, in terms of the efficacy with uh, the bigotran, which was the first one, there's a 34% reduction, and um, rivaroxaban or uh, Xarelto is not inferior to warfarin, it was about the same. Apixaban or Eliquis showed a 20% reduction in, in stroke. 50% reduction in hemorrhagic stroke, so less bleeding in the brain for all of these than with warfarin. Um, and so, and then edoxaban, which is not used in our country, show is non-inferior also. But what's interesting is that in terms of major bleeding with apixaban and with edoxaban, it's less than one we see with, with warfarin. What about aspirin? Well, there was one study published in 1991 that suggested aspirin may prevent stroke and AFib that's never been repeated. And that is, no, one has ever, no other study has shown that after many studies. So there is no role for aspirin in the treatment of atrial fibrillation. It can be used in conjunction with an anticoagulant if someone has peripheral vascular disease or coronary heart disease, so we would use a small amount of aspirin. But aspirin will not prevent stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation. Uh, so, the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, has recommendations that uh, cardiologists follow. And in terms of this CHAS-VAS score, if you have a score of 2 
in men or three in women, anticoagulants are recommended. And in fact, if one has a score of one, we give it serious thought about going on to, to use an anticoagulant um, because uh, the, of the risk of stroke. So if you have a 78-year-old female with atrial fib, high blood pressure, and heart failure, so she gets a, a score of one, well, uh, because she's female, Hypertension, you get a score also uh, of, of one. She's 78, over 75, so there's two points for that. And then also a point for CHF. So she has a CHAS VAS score of five, which gives about a 6.7% a annual risk of stroke. So do we anticoagulate or not? One would think, one would definitely the recommendation is you have a score of two or three or higher, yes, you're going to anticoagulate. But in terms of patients like this, in real life, only about 50% of people who should be, based on current recommendations, people who should be anticoagulated, only about 50% are. And that may be in there's various reasons. Um, in terms of taking the neural neuro or, or anticoagulants, sometimes I've had patients say, I can't afford it. You know, um, uh, they are expensive. Uh, sometimes some patients feel like, well, I just don't want to take these because of the risk of bleeding. I live way out, and I'm concerned that I might cut myself or whatever. Um, but only about 50 percent uh, will take these medicines for various reasons. So we need to do a better job of that. Now, in terms of, and then we'll discuss what else we can do. Uh, for instance, if someone cannot take an anticoagulant because of issues with um, ulcer disease or bleeding. But let's now go to look at. Now, there's a device called a Watchman device. Watchman, I don't know if you've heard of that. And there's an implantable device that fills up that windsock so you can't get clots there. And that's been shown to be as effective as anticoagulants to prevent stroke. But that's only for people who cannot take anticoagulants. In the future, it's going to evolve that if someone says, you know, I don't want to take an anticoagulant, I want that Watchman device, then uh, the FDA will eventually give approval to one to say, well, I want it and you can get it. But right now, one can't say, I just want it because I don't want to take anticoagulants because the insurance companies won't pay for it. The FDA won't pay for it yet, but that's going to come. And physicians are, uh, the electrophysiologists do that procedure, and they are actually getting better and better at, at, at doing that. Um, the group in, in Anchorage, oh, by the way, in terms of uh, you know, cardiology in Alaska, uh, when I've, I've had the opportunity to speak in Anchorage a couple of times at, at our annual meetings, and, um, and we say, you know, it's a large state, but we're a small community. We work very well together in, in terms of um, referring patients to Anchorage, and then they have patients come back here, and we take care of. So it's a very nice cardiology community. Um, so that's one thing that can be done is that using that Watchman device to plug up the appendage. When patients have open heart surgery, occasionally the surgeons will go on in to remove that atrial appendage. That also reduces the risk of stroke. If we just want to control the heart rate, then there are certain medicines um, that we will use to control heart rate. And the medicine depends on whether you have any other cardiovascular disease, so you have hypertension, a weak heart, or is underlying COPD from cigarette smoking. If someone has no other cardiovascular disease, then we can use beta blockers, we can use calcium channel blockers. If there's high blood pressure, we can use the same three medications. If the heart is weak, we can use beta blockers and digoxin, but we don't use calcium channel blockers. If there's COPD, then we have to be very careful with beta blockers because it may make the patient more short of breath or cause bronchospasm. And um, amiodarone, which is a medicine that can, we use it frequently, but it can affect the thyroid gland, it can affect the liver. If you're out in the sun, it can turn your skin a tinge of blue. Um, and um, it can affect the eyes, it can affect the lungs, um, if one stays on a high dose. If one is taking anywhere from 100 to 200 milligrams daily, we generally don't see those problems with amiodarone. But it's another medicine that, that one can take. Now, when, in terms of heart rate control, if we slow the heart down in someone with AFib, then chest discomfort, dizziness, shortness of breath may go away. But 
fatigue, just not having the energy, generally takes being in a normal heart rhythm. Okay. And um, so for asymptomatic people, or for patients who have fatigue, we may want to do a cardioversion, do a shock treatment to get one back to, to a normal rhythm. So for rhythm control, getting your heart back to a normal rhythm, there are certain medicines we can use, amiodarone, uh, Dofetilide, Motac, some of you may have heard of, Fleconide, Propafenon, Sotolol, these are all medicines we use to try to maintain a normal heart rhythm. Now, there are at least five studies that have shown that rate control strategy compared to rhythm control, that is just slowing the heart down, let the person stay in AFib versus getting them back to a normal rhythm, which is better, where it's been shown that there's no mortality benefit we don't save lives by getting the person back to a normal rhythm. One, we live just as long in AFib as long as we keep the heart rate down and take an anticoagulant to prevent stroke. So we don't, if someone doesn't have symptoms and you're doing fine, there's nothing wrong with staying in atrial fibrillation and just controlling the heart rate. So when should an antiarrhythmic drug be started? Well, we generally don't do that with the first episode of AFib because it may be because someone had a few too many beers um, and then became dehydrated. Or sometimes we have patients who drink more than a pot of coffee a day, and that can cause it too. Um, you heard the good news about coffee this morning, is, you know, about reducing um, liver disease uh, information. Yeah. Uh, but that's black. Well, so in terms of coffee, and this, I know we're getting off track here a little bit, but that's without cream and sugar in terms of coffee being okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, now, if someone has heart failure in AFib, you may want to try to get that person back to a normal rhythm to, to maintain that atrial, the atrial kick. If, if re the recurrence threatens death or hospitalization, then we should try to keep the person out of AFib. Um, if there's infrequent episodes, then sometimes we use what's called a pill in the pocket. There's certain medicines that we can use that a person can take to jolt the heart back to a normal rhythm, but it has to be someone who doesn't have a history of, of a heart attack or coronary artery disease. And um, so sometimes the decision to put someone back in a normal rhythm is based on uh, just on lifestyle issues. So in someone with newly diagnosed AFib and blood pressure is fine, and they're, doing okay, they're tolerating it, then we put them on anticoagulant for at least three weeks before we try to get you back to a normal heart rhythm. If we do it too soon, then there may have been a clot there that will travel when the heart begins to, when it goes back to a normal rhythm. So we like to anticoagulate for at least three weeks. And then we do a cardioversion. Now, in some cases, uh, decisions made that well, we want to cardiovert sooner rather than later, then we do what's called a transesophageal echo, a TEE, put a probe down, make sure there's no clots there, then we can cardiovert and then put the patient on anticoagulant therapy and you have to stay on for at least a month before we decide to take the person off. How do we maintain sinus rhythm? Well, again, it depends on whether you have heart disease, uh, high blood pressure, um, coronary artery disease, heart failure, we choose certain drugs based on whether the patient has this or not. And providers, physicians go through this scenario with every patient to treat everyone as an individual because some people may have high blood pressure and, and have a very thick heart and, and some don't. And the choice of drugs depends on whether there's underlying heart disease or not when we're trying to keep someone in a normal heart rhythm. When we look at catheter ablation, doing a radio frequency ablation uh, with um, AFib, it's been shown that ablation was associated with a 38% reduction in atrial arrhythmias and a 68% reduction in hospitalizations compared with drugs. So ablations work very well. Uh, generally, though, one would not be referred for an ablation unless you're having um, significant symptoms uh, with AFib. However, uh, if someone says, well, I don't want to stay on drugs, I don't want... Uh, I want to get an ablation then, an ablation is done, but we do not do a atrial fib ablation to get someone off anticoagulant therapy. If the CHAS VAS score is two or three or higher, then one should stay on because we don't know if the person is going to go back into atrial fib or not. Um, if one goes to, it depends on where you go. If, if for instance, 
uh, it, when I send patients to Anchorage for an ablation, um, uh, they're quoted like a 80 or 90% success rate. If I send a person to Mayo, they said a 70% uh, success rate. So, and then it, it, facilities vary too in terms of what techniques they use for ablations, but we don't do an ablation to take someone off intact wagon therapy. But we can do an ablation to get patients off other drugs. So, 78 year old man with AFib and hypertension, and uh, this is a CHAS score, which we used to use before the CHAS VASC, but the score was two. What's the risk of bleeding in someone with high blood pressure who's 78 years old? Well, there's a, we have a scoring system for that too, and it's called the, one of them is called HASBLED, and we put in the patient's information, high blood pressure and age over 65, gets two points. One study suggests that this person has a 4% chance of bleeding annually, but other studies have shown that this is more like 2% chance. So one has to, we look at that and we say, well, that person's at risk and you have to be extra careful about not falling and cutting yourself and whatever. It doesn't tell us that we cannot use an anticoagulant, but it gives an idea of how much risk the patient has for bleeding. And so we have to, this is kind of busy, but we have to look at the bleeding risk versus the clotting risk in any given patient. And in certain scenarios, one would be high risk versus moderate versus low. And we have to go through this thought process with all patients to try to help the patient to make a decision along with us on, am I going to take the risk of taking anticoagulant? Or am I going to take the risk of having a stroke? This is a busy slide, but there are antidotes is what I want to show here. There are medicines to reverse the anticoagulant. They are extremely expensive and they're not available throughout the country. They are in large centers, generally in the lower 48. Uh, in general, when someone has bleeding related to um, Eliquis, Apixaban, Rivaroxaban, then we just stop the medicine and we give the person a transfusion. There are other things we can do with uh, some clotting factors that, that one can be given. Um, but in general, we just stop the medicine. And here, this slide, the new anticoagulant anti antidotes, um, the first one came out was one to uh, reverse the bigger trend. And uh, there's one, there's uh, two that are available now for, um, for Xarelto, Rivaroxaban, and also uh, Apixaban. We don't have one, to my knowledge, there's not one in town um, yet. So in general, if someone is, now, what bleeding do we get concerned about? What well, gastrointestinal bleeding, if a patient is throwing up blood, whatever, stop the medicine, it's generally out of the system within 24 hours, and we transfuse if, if need be. How do we lower the risk of developing atrial fibrillation? Well, we lower it because we can lower it by working on those factors that cause AFib. Okay, the risk factors are high blood pressure, so let's treat the blood pressure, get, get the blood pressure down. Diabetes, um, better control of diabetes. Uh, obesity, lowering the body weight. Lowering the body weight can also. Sleep apnea is a common cause for AFib. And sleep apnea is, um, is very interesting because when one has apnea, you know, when you stop breathing, there's a surge of adrenaline. And that surge of adrenaline is damaging to the heart. Every time that happens, we, we lose a few myofibrils. Um, and that too, that stimulation, and then what happens is uh, frequently people with sleep apnea would have unusual dreams and nightmares, like they're running, being chased, ch fighting, or whatever, and that's because of a surge of adrenaline. You get that fight or flight phenomenon, and that can cause the heart to, to go into an abnormal rhythm. So sleep apnea is a problem. Excessive alcohol, uh, heart failure, so treating heart failure. So if we can correct these things, then we can reduce the risk of, a, of, of atrial fibrillation. And these are various mechanisms of, of what we can do. Get the blood pressure down below 140. Get the A1C for diabetics below 7. Uh, bring the, the body weight down. And um, early diagnosis of sleep apnea and use CPAP if need be. Alcohol, um, because alcohol is a class 1 carcinogen, because of that reason, women should not exceed one unit per day, and men should not exceed two. 
Uh, so, and so why two for men? Well, we're not going to take good care of ourselves anyway, so <laughs> we don't live as long. So why, you know, why fight it, right? Um, but it has to, it, of course, there's other reasons of that, you know, because of breast tissue and whatever, women are high risk, but, um, but men are not going to listen. <laughs> Maybe to their wives, not to me. Um, so um, what are some uh, take home messages here? Well, Ancient revelation is prevalent, and this problem is predicted to double by 2030. It is a major problem for us. In nature free of the risk of stroke often far exceeds the, um, the bleeding risk or the bleeding complications with anticoagulant therapy. So generally, we, we should take the anticoagulant. The risk of developing atrophy can be reduced. That's important. We can reduce the risk. Stay well hydrated. Bring the weight down. If you have sleep apnea, treat that. Lower blood pressure. And don't drink excessively. Now, anticoagulants are underprescribed for various reasons. Uh, and it may be uh, patients are failing to follow the advice of healthcare providers, or healthcare providers are not prescribing the AFib. I had a, 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 an echo tech um, come to my office yesterday and he said, Hey, I have this patient who had a stroke, went to the ER with a stroke three days ago, and um, an echocardiogram was ordered, and, and he said, um, and I noticed that the patient um, was in atrial fib. And uh, so I quickly read the echo, and, um, and when the patient had left, and we called the patient back, and I saw the patient yesterday, and uh, put him on anticoagulant therapy because he had a stroke, and we don't want another stroke. So uh, we have to act quickly uh, when we see patients with, with these problems. That's our beautiful hospital. And do we have any questions? Thank you. What is ablation therapy and how does that work to eliminate some of the risk of AFib? It's a great question. Uh, we now know that in terms of AFib, uh, the pulmonary veins, the veins that leave the lungs that come back to the heart, there are four pulmonary veins that enter the left atrium. Right where the pulmonary veins come to the left atrium, that's an area that becomes irritable. There are nerve fibers around each vein. So an electrophysiologist uh, can go in and do what's called cryoablation. Now, they use a, a balloon that's uh, a cold balloon, go in and freeze those nerve endings. Or, and so that's done in many places. Mayo um, doesn't like to do that procedure. So at Mayo Clinic, they like to go in and still use a probe to dot around to use um, uh, infrared or a uh, different type of, of uh, energy to, to destroy those nerve endings. So an ablation means they go in and destroy those nerve endings by some mechanism. There's also a procedure called a maze procedure that's done when someone has open heart surgery, where a surgeon will go in and use a, um, do a uh, zigzag pattern to disrupt those nerve pathways in the atrium. And uh, that's been done for many years. And it doesn't work as nearly as well as the endovascular procedure. Now, with, with the radial frequency ablation, um, with what I do, I tell patients there's a one in a thousand chance that they may have a stroke because I'm going into an artery. With the atrial fibrillation, they're not going into an artery at all. They're going to the venous system and they go up through the right common femoral vein, they go from the right atrium, go across the left atrium to get into where those um, fibers are uh, along, along the pulmonary veins. So it's a low pressure system, the risk is lower. And so for that, I tell patients it may be like one in 5,000 that someone would have a stroke. Um, there can be complications, but the risk is, is very low. The ablation takes four to six hours to do. It takes a long time to do it, yeah. And um, the success rate is about 80%. And if one goes back for a second, it, it increases to about 90% success rate. Yeah. I have a couple of questions about blood thinners. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is, what percentage of your patients choose to go with a warfarin versus the newer drugs? And as far as the newer ones go, what do you do when a person that's on the newer drugs, if we don't have the reversal medicine to stop the bleeding, what happens when they're in a car wreck? 
Yeah, so uh, let's go with the correct first. Um, and actually, I think that there have been lawsuits in reference to that. Um, not many, but some. There's always going to be lawsuits, though, right? Um, so there's uh, protein complex con concentrates that really thicken the blood. So for the case like that, when someone is in an auto accident, uh, that's done, and the clotting factors are given. And of course, people are, are transfused um, right away. But that can be a, a problem. Yeah, when someone is on anticoagulant and you have major internal injury, um, and that can be a problem even with warfarin too, because when we give the vitamin K, it's not instantaneous. It takes an hour or two or three to, to get the blood. Um, you know, and actually, and we've had patients on anticoagulants, you know, with prosthetic valves who take anticoagulants for years, and it's not a, it's, it's a concern, but it's not a major concern. Now, what's, uh, in terms of warfarin versus the neural agents, uh, the guidelines now are if we can get the person to the neural agents because they're more effective um, and actually safer than warfarin because you don't have this up and down in terms of the, the INR, the international normalized ratio. We like to keep it between two to three if one has AFib. And then sometimes it may be 1.5 or maybe six or seven. And um, so it's a lot, it's, it's more difficult. Now, though, um, I do have quite a few patients of uh, patients who are on warfarin who do their own test at home. And they test weekly and do a great job uh, with doing that. Um, that has to be cleared through the Coumadin Clinic and that sort of thing and through the company, but that can be done. Uh, the percent of my patients who are on the neural agents versus warfarin, I would say that of the patients that I have on anticoagulants, 90% are on the neural agents rather than taking warfarin. It's just so much easier to take, for instance, uh, Eliquis twice a day or to take um, Xarelto, Rivaroxaban, in, um, once a day. Now, Xarelto, one has to take with a little bit of food for, for it to be absorbed. So the commercial says, take it with your evening meal. Well, they say that only because they think everyone, most people will eat at least something in the evening. But you can take it any time of day as long as you take it with some food, with Rivaroxaban or Xarelto. Um, with a Pixaban, uh, it does not interact with food, and one can take it, um, can take it twice a day. And, and, but you take it twice a day. And, now, and sometimes we back off and don't give the full strength. For instance, the full strength for Eliquis is five milligrams twice a day. Sometimes patients are concerned, and if one gets concerned, say, okay, we'll cut it in half. Uh, I don't do that because um, if we don't give the proper dose, then one is that a person will be at risk for suffering a stroke. Um, but if someone's like, there are certain factors we we'll look at. If you weigh less than 60 kilograms, weigh less than about 125 pounds, uh, if someone is over the age of 85, uh, or if there's kidney problems, if you have two out of three factors, two out of three of those, then we cut the dose in half. Yeah, but I, they really have, um, uh, worked extremely well for us. And that, in fact, we use these newer thinners for more than just AFib. We use them for pulmonary emboli, pulmonary, uh, patients with blood clots. And we see quite a few pulmonary emboli with people you know, taking the long flights, coming to Alaska, uh, or flying to other places. We use it for deep venous thrombosis. So, um, And then in terms of reversal agents, I think that's even going to improve uh, in terms of cost coming down and, and more effective reversal agents also. Yes, sir. What is the retention time for a medication like Xarelto? How long does it stay in your system? Yeah, so uh, if, if someone's going to go to surgery, we tell them to stop the medicine. Um, we, we like to have you off the medicine for three half-lives, and, and the half-life is about 12 to 14 hours. So for Xarelto or for Apixaban, we have patients off for at least 48 hours for, for most surgeries. If it's neurosurgery, then we may have them off for uh, at least four days. Yeah. But after two days, it's pretty much, in terms of it having an effect, it's, it's gone. Yeah. Yes. So why do they think AFib is going to increase? And is this study in just the US or the whole world? That's a great question. You know, that's what's so straight. To, were you born in May? Excuse me. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> were you born in May? Uh, no, no, March. Uh, March, close. So I, so I had those same questions. 
I was born in May. I just thought maybe you and I were connected oh. somewhere. But um, um, so why is it increasing? You, actually, so if you look at a chart, and I, don't, I should have put it in here. If you look at the obesity rate in the United States, it's skyrocketing. Yep. It, it is. I mean, it's not 11 at all. It's just going up. Okay, and so that's one of the factors, right? So high blood pressure, uh, the rate of, we're getting more and more people with hypertension, more and more people with heart failure, that's also going up. We are, um, we are wonderful people in terms of our country. We are, but we are not healthy. <laughs> we're not. Um, that doesn't mean we won't become healthy at some point, but we just, so we are becoming more and more unhealthy, and that AFib is going, is right, it's a part of all that. So it's not necessarily the whole world, it's more the U.S. Oh, no, no, oh, so I'm sorry, the second, no. And the whole world is getting even, uh, becoming more unhealthy also. In fact, in terms of heart attacks, it's happening, it's, that, that's increasing much faster in third, third world countries uh, because of, sometimes because of handouts, right? Because we send, um, but I don't know. I, so I recall when I was a child and, um, um, even, uh, we, we were poor, and of course my friends were poor, and they used to get commodities. But you see the stuff they give people who commodities? I mean, it's just thick cheese, and it's the stuff that kills you. You know, so, so nationally, third world countries, uh, uh, the uh, obesity rate is going up uh, extremely fast. But no, yeah, so nationally, I think the country with the highest obesity rate could be actually be Saudi Arabia, actually. Uh, and that's not, you know, and that's, they're affluent, right? But uh, so many, uh, throughout the world, uh, we are becoming uh, less healthy. Um, and so that's why we're going to see. And then that, that issue about 2030, that's for our country, yeah, that is going up. But we're just not aren't taking good care of ourselves. Um, which may change, you know, that's hope for us. First of all, you've mentioned a lot about vitamin K as being a, uh, I guess an ingredient of these anticoagulant drugs. And I was wondering what foods carry vitamin K? Yeah, yeah. So, and actually, what I mentioned though about, about vitamin K uh, was that um, warfarin is actually a vitamin K antagonist. So, uh, so vitamin K, um, if you give um, uh, a vitamin K antagonist, it can affect, it will block uh, factors. 2, 7, 9, and 10, okay? And so foods that have vitamin K can counteract the warfarin and green, thick green vegetables. Green leafy vegetables will have a lot of vitamin K. In, yeah, have vitamin K, yeah. Yeah, and so, um, so the vitamins that we have, to, so for instance, people taking vitamins. Naturally, I don't recommend that anyone take vitamins uh, at all um, because you get all your vitamins from, from greens, all your vitamins except vitamin, vitamin D. Um, which we get, we should get from sunlight. However, from September through May, the UV index in Fairbanks is less than three. If it's less than three, you don't make vitamin D. So in this, from where we are, I'd say, well, you should take vitamin D3. And I, I, maybe 2000 IU. Um, if you have blue, blue eyes and blonde hair, you make vitamin D faster than anyone else in the world. And you only need you, one or 2,000, right? But if you are a black sub-Saharan African, then you actually have to take maybe 6,000 because someone with blue eyes can make vitamin D in 15 minutes. Someone who has a lot of pigment, it takes an hour and a half. Uh, so, and then just, it's debated whether we should take vitamin D or not, it really is. But um, in places like this, it's reasonable, but we shouldn't overdo it. Like, uh, I worry when I see patients taking 10,000 IU of vitamin D. That's, that's an awful lot. Uh, it's better to, to get sunlight. And when you can get sunlight in the summers, don't take the vitamin D. Because um, the vitamin D that you get from sunlight, some of it stays in the skin and it helps to prevent skin cancer, actually. The vitamin D that we take never gets into the skin and it does not help us to prevent uh, skin cancer. So, uh, so vitamin K, the issue with that is that warfarin is a vitamin K antagonist. The other drugs work by blocking other factors and they have nothing to do with vitamin K at all. Does that answer the question? Okay, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. And then 
Um, also, uh, you talked about aspirin therapy. Mm -hmm. You know, is that being very useful for people with AFib conditions? Is it? Is there any role for it for people without AFib conditions? Yeah, no, great question. Yeah. So if you're uh, there is a calculator that can be done online uh, for the risk of suffering a heart attack or stroke within the next 10 years. And it's based on your age, your race, your total cholesterol level, HDL level, whether you have high blood pressure or not, whether you're diabetic. And if your risk, if your 10-year risk is intermediate or high, particularly if it's high, then one should take an aspirin. And what's intermediate risk? Well, anything between... Um, 10% up to 20%. Some would say even up above 5% risk. Um, then one should take an aspirin. If you're low risk, who's low risk? Well, if your blood pressure is less than 120 over 80, if you don't have metabolic syndrome, and that is if you don't have a low HDL, you don't have high cholesterol, you don't have high triglycerides, you don't have hypertension, when you start having these, if you have these other problems, high blood pressure, glucose intolerance, so diabetes, um, blood pressure, uh, I mentioned that already. Um, if you don't have those issues, then your risk is low. Now, if you are 75 years of age, uh, let's talk about age a little bit here. So, <clears throat> young, uh, old age, old starts at 65. But that's a young old. And it's the advantage in being young old because you still have energy and you are experienced so you know how to have fun without getting in trouble. Um, so the young old, that goes up to age 74. The middle old is 75 to 84 and the old old is 85 and above. If you are 75 years old in our country, you are high risk. So no matter how you feel, and think of yourself as being young despite being 75, you should take an aspirin is my point. Uh, because there's, there's not many Americans who are low risk. Now, I say that, however, uh, you ever heard of the coronary calcium score? Uh, that's a test that I recommend for men over the age of 45, women over the age of 55, and it's a CAT scan of the chest to see if you have hardening of the arteries. And, and I'm going to talk to administration about lowering the cost for that test here in Fairbanks. Um, uh, it costs $500 that insurance companies may not pay for. However, in most other places, like in Anchorage, it's only $100, um, which is unusual. Right? But in the lower 48, before I came here, I was uh, at our hospital, we only charge 75. You don't try to make money off the test, you just, just enough to do it. But um, when I was learning to do coronary calcium scores, when I was learning to do coronary CT, um, I was in California and a 80 year old lady came in to have a coronary calcium score and I said, boy, she's wasting her time and money, right? Well, in California it doesn't cost. California's different. It doesn't cost in California. Insurance companies pay for it. But at any rate, her score was zero, which is amazing. And there are quite a few people, old age of 75, that don't have any calcium in their arteries. So in those cases, do you really need an aspirin? No. Do you need a statin? Nope. You don't need them. You know? Uh, but for most of us, there's calcium in our arteries because of genetics, or because how we grew up, how we lived, and we, how we ate, <laughs> uh, how we do eat. Um, we do have calcification. You just never know. Uh, you have people who misbehave and have zero calcium. You have some who do everything right and have a lot of calcium in arteries. So that is a test that, that we're going to offer to the community. We did a study here um, at, uh, over a year and a half, and we did, oh, I think about 200 patients or so, and, uh, and we found uh, quite a few people with scores of zero, and some who we actually told you can stop taking a statin because they didn't have any plaque in their arteries at all. It's a simple test. Uh, the amount of radi radiation is less than a mammogram, and with the new CT scanner at FMH, uh, it's very low radiation dose. And so that's one thing that can be done too in terms of predicting whether someone has increased risk. So for some of us, yes, we should take an aspirin. Now, how much aspirin? A baby aspirin. The best aspirin is the bare, chewable baby aspirin. Uh, coated aspirin may not work. Um, it doesn't always get absorbed. So um, I would be careful about coated aspirin. Um, you know, the, the baby aspirin tastes good anyway, the little chewable one. <laughs> I'm intrigued by your um, 
early comments about the device called Cardiant, I think it was. Can yeah. you talk a bit about more, more about that? Is that something that you would advise people use as a monitoring tool? Well, you know, so it's kind of interesting. Uh, it, I'm not advertising anything, OK? <laughs> And in fact, I've had quite a few patients come in, and they they were proud of their cardio. Um, and uh, and I didn't ask for one. I don't. I, I lose things all the time. So, um, but at any rate, to, to before I say something about cardio, you know, I'm really impressed with the Apple Watch. Does anyone have an Apple Watch in here? So it's so nice about them because I've had patients come in. You know, if you fall, it 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 um, it's, it calls 911. You know. And, uh, and it would say, you know, it, it'll give you a moment to say, I'm okay, I didn't hurt myself, and you turn it off, you know? And of course, um, it's pretty good with rhythm discrimination. Now, um, Cardia is also nice, and so it's a little um, device where you just put two fingers on, and it would give you a rhythm strip, and it tells you if your heart rhythm is regular or irregular or not, and let you know if you're an AFib. And if you want to have more leads, and who needs more leads? I mean, a cardiologist, I would be interested in that, but who needs more leads? No one does. But you have to put two fingers in one knee. <laughs> yeah. And, um, but it's kind of, it's cute. I mean, it's, it's, it's neat. Um, uh, so let me tell you what, quickly what we should do to be healthy. Um, uh, the 10,000 steps is great. Um, if you stay on a healthy diet, and that is you don't have animal protein every day, or if you do, minimize the amount of animal protein. Um, and you eat uh, fruits and vegetables, and you reduce the amount of oil. And the reason why to reduce oil is that oil just has a lot of calories that we don't need, right? If so, we do that. Uh, if you're on a healthy diet and you exercise 2,000 calories a week, if you have plaque, you can stabilize it or reverse it just with doing those two things. So 10,000 steps, that's, that's five miles, right? And, uh, and so you get 100 calories off per, um, per mile. Uh, so if you're doing 20 miles a week, so four miles a day, five days a week, or five miles, four days a week, that's 2,000 calories. And it's, several studies have shown that if we are active, and it doesn't have to be walking, it's just uh, if you're uh, shoveling snow, or if you're working around the house, just being active, as long as you're burning the calories, that along with a healthy diet. Um, uh, running is good. You don't have to run. If we walk anywhere from three to five miles an hour, that's heart healthy. You know? um, so we need to be more active. We just really have to find time to do that. And then drinking enough water is good, uh, important too, particularly for men. We have to drink, or we should drink, at least 40 ounces of liquid a day. That's not a, we should drink more than that. But if a man drinks at least five glasses of water a day, you reduce your risk of a heart attack by 50%. Yeah. Uh, it may, so I don't know what the, the number is for women. Uh, the study didn't look at that, unfortunately. Um, yeah, so, uh, so those things, and of course with alcohol. So we used to think that you have to drink to live a long time. And... Um, um, but now it's been proven that that's not true. You don't have to drink to live a long time. Um, and excessive drinking can be a problem, right? But Dan Buettner, who wrote The Blue Zones, um, he went around the world to find people live, communities where there are people 100 years of age and older. Well, he said wine at five. Uh, the Sardinians, who live a long time, drink red wine three times a day. The men do. And they tend goats. Their wives carry the guns and take care of all the business. So the Sardinian men live a long time because they have very little stress, <laughs> you know? And they drink a lot, but the Seventh-day Adventists don't drink and they live a long time, you know? And so uh, Loma Linda, California is the place where there are a lot of old people who are very healthy and, and they, don't, um, they don't say they drink. Um, some Adventists do, but most don't. Um, did I, I don't know if I answered your question. I kind of got, what, what was your other issue? I'm just curious about it. I'm okay. Like oh, I think it should. I mean, it's kind of interesting anyway. Yeah, cardio, I don't know how much the thing costs. It was a Father's Day present. But, um, I Googled it, $70. Okay. <laughs> That's a lot cheaper than uh, Apple Watch, <laughs> I think. <laughs> 
No, I think the cardio is nice. You know, it, it can tell you. But you know, now, quite a few patients have become and say, I know my heart's out of rhythm because I was taking my blood pressure. And you know, and that gives you a little signal. That lets you know if you have an erratic heartbeat too, uh, when you're monitoring your blood pressure with blood pressure monitors. Yeah, so that's another way of doing it, right? Or if you uh, have any symptoms, you can also go to your provider and they can order a Holter monitor, uh, the 24 hour recording. And there, there's all the information we can get from the Holter also. Um, and it, because we count all the heartbeats and we know exactly what percent of PBCs you have. Um, and if, you, if it's less than 3% for actual heartbeats, then that's okay. If it's more than 15%, that's an awful lot. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. One last question for Dr. Ren. So with like PBCs and stuff, what about CoQ10? Uh, yeah, so CoQ10 was studied uh, about 20 years ago, and we were not finding any benefit. Uh, resources were not, so the company took it away from them. However, in the past five years, CoQ10 has been um, reevaluated, and it was found that people with heart disease, those who take CoQ10, do better than those who don't. Now we do prescribe or tell patients to take CoQ10 if you're taking a statin. Because statins will cause muscle weakness uh, because uh, the statin stops cholesterol from being produced. Well, coenzyme Q10 is in the same pathway. So it's not being produced either. Um, ubiquinone is not being produced either. So if you take it, it kind of re replenishes the CoQ10. Mitochondria need CoQ10 to function properly. So CoQ10 has never been shown to hurt anyone, and uh, it may be helpful. So, um, and I tell patients take it in like 200 uh, milligrams once or twice a day if you're taking a statin. If you don't taking a statin, we don't know that it's. Uh, if you have a, years ago, we wondered if it would, would cause a weak heart to become stronger. I never saw it do that, you know. But if you're taking a statin, it's not a bad idea to take CoQ10. Okay. Thank you very much for the talk. You're welcome. Thank you all.